All right, let's get started. So <coughs> I posted the, the fifth homework, which is basically the, the linked list again, but we're going to do it uh, in a few different lock-free ways. I think the linked list is good. It, it's simple enough that it's hard to make a mistake in the linked list logic or not to understand it, but then it has enough computational complexity that the stuff that we're playing with actually has some significant uh, impact. Uh, if we d were to do this on a hash table, it would be a lot less interesting. Like RCU on a hash table is not probably worthwhile. Uh, whereas on a, on a tree it probably is, but then it gets really complicated. All right, so um, for this homework, we'll do uh, a linked list again, and we'll implement first an RCU version of the, of the linked list, where the readers are accessing the list without any uh, synchronization at all. And then the writers are being a little extra careful. And the only part where they really have to be extra careful is the, uh, the freeing of a deleted element. So um, in the first version, there's three different versions that we're doing here. And now you're uh, given access to, sorry, to one more machine here that's lines. It's a 64 core. Well, AMD has a different definition of cores, but but 64 hardware threads at least um, at the same time. So we'll, we'll evaluate these things with up to 64 threads, the various programs. Um, so we're starting with, um, the, let's see, yeah, a baseline that just basically is a, a big fat lock. So you have something to compare, compare against. But then the uh, RCU version, and then we're doing a fine grain locking with RCU. Not hand over hand locking, that will be slightly different. Um, and then finally an entirely lock free list. We'll compare these, these three to each other. So in the first version, you have a big fat lock that the, the writers are using. So this means there isn't really um, any, anything complicated here. What's a little complicated is getting uh, RCU to work. There's, it's a little little special, but we have a, an implementation of RCU that you'll, you'll be using. Um, so so uh, basically they have to be, the writers have to be careful about releasing um, deleted nodes so that if a reader is currently accessing that node, it doesn't get confused. This is kind of a rare uh, occurrence, but it's still, um, it will happen every now and then, and then you'll have a crash or a, um, or worse, uh, some sort of a logic bug that you can't trace down. Okay, so um, I guess we'll take a quick look at, at uh, the, this RCU implementation. It's called QSBR, and just to see what the interface is, and perhaps we'll take a brief look at the, at the code. Um, so you basically only need to worry about this interface QSBR.C is interesting. Um, it might be informative about how the how you're supposed to use this. There's no documentation, um, but um, it's more or less self-explanatory. So the the principle of RCU, if you remember, is that you don't delete the or you don't free anything immediately. You wait until no one's using it, and then you free it. And how do you know that no one's using it? Well, you wait long enough. It's the general idea. And if you're doing it in the kernel, you, you actually do it that way. The readers are not telling you anything. You just, uh, you just wait for a certain amount of, of time, and then you know for sure that no kernel code would ever take longer than this to stop using your, um, your data structure or whatever it is you're protecting. Uh, in user space, it's not like that. We have no guarantees. So the, the, the user thread has to, or the reader thread has to tell us um, something about its progress. And that's called a quiescent state. Basically, the reader says, okay, I'm done using things right now, now I'm relaxed, and then it runs again. Right? But ev every one of these quiescent states kind of says something about progress. Um, so when you go from one, uh, sort of when you pass one quiescent state, that means that you're done with the old versions and so now you start using the newer version next time. Something like that. All right, so each thread needs to maintain um, 
uh, a bit of data about um, what it's been freeing. So this is not for readers, uh, at least most of it. Um, it's primarily for writers. So there's a free list here. Uh, basically, oh, I freed something uh, in this at this time. Epoch is just an integer that's incrementing, but uh, we're keeping track of when we freed something so that at some point we decide that it is now safe to, to release it. All right, so to set everything up, you need to uh, first call QSBR init somewhere once, and then for every thread you're running, you need to run this pthread init to initialize the data structure that belongs to, uh, to each thread. So you'll need to allocate one of those. And there's actually a very handy, the code that we're using is, is sort of well set up to experiment with various um, types of synchronization. We look at uh, benchmark list.h, I think. Yeah, here it is. Um, so this is the pthread data that you probably have seen before. But um, it's basically some data about what the thread is supposed to be doing. It's used in the mostly in the driver code, the benchmark and the test stuff, um, for the thread to remember local local variables or thread local data. But this one is important today. So we'll use this data structure specific data, you point that to one of those QSBR structs. That's sort of how we get at it. Um, so for every operation, uh, you know, we're, past the, we're already getting passed in this pthread data t, so you can uh, just get your uh, QSBR data, which you'll need for QSBR operations. Okay, so here it is. Um, you want to initialize at some point, you need to pass in that pointer. Um, whenever a reader is done accessing the list, basically that will be at the end of a, of a find function for this version. Um, you need to call this quiescent uh, state, and that will sometimes free up some elements. Uh, and then uh, if you're a writer and you're, you're freeing an element, you can't use the normal malloc free, that will screw everything up. You want to use this one to basically add it to the free list rather than adding it in back into malloc. Um, <coughs> let's take a, just a quick look at quiescent state to see what it does. There it is. Okay, so um, so it looks like oh, if this isn't um, if we have an old epoch, like if the the if time has moved forward, so uh, everyone is working with uh, a newer newer version, then we are responsible for freeing it. So we go ahead and free it. Looks like um, basically the, the the message here is the readers are responsible for freeing if it turns out that um, no one else is using it. Like we're the last one out the gate for this for this version. You don't need to worry about this code, but it's, it seems like uh, could be an interesting exercise to just see what's going on. It's kind of complicated because, well, synchronization code is complicated. Okay, um, let's go back to the description here. Yeah, so this one should actually be pretty simple. What is complicated is just kind of fitting this QSBR framework into the, the list, but um, that's software engineering. And then, um, yeah, so again, we'll be wanting to generate the same kind of plots. If you did homework four, homework five will be pretty easy in that regard. Um, and then we get to a little, probably a faster version. And so here, we're using RCU for all iteration through the, through the list, all, all traversal of the list. So if you're a writer, you also traverse the list with RCU. This is awesome because now all the writers operate at the same time as opposed to kind of with a big fat lock going one at a time or with the spin lock spending all their time, sorry, with the hand over hand locking, spending all their time acquiring locks. Um, now we're uh, just blowing through the list. But unfortunately, we have a potential consistency problem, right? So now we've run through this list, we found the element that we want to 
say, in where the place where we want to insert our element. And then we now we need to acquire a lock. Like this version is uh, supposed to use, use locking. So now you acquire a lock on that node that you want to insert after. But it's not clear that by the time you've acquired the lock, that that was the node that you want to insert after. Right? Because you weren't holding locks on all this the whole time. So the list could have changed in between when you decided this is the lock you want, or this is the node you want, and when you actually get the node. So you have to be careful about verifying that it's still OK after you acquire the, the locks that you need. So for, for insertion, it's just the one lock. For deletion, again, it's the two locks. It's the previous and the current that you need to, to hold. But you'll have to verify that it actually, um, that those are still the nodes that you want. In the, in the deletion case, I guess you want to make sure that uh, the node wasn't already deleted. Because right? it could be someone else you're working with RCU, you're potentially working on an old list. It's always like that, a slightly old version. Um, you decide you want to delete it, another thread may have already deleted it by the time you acquire those locks. And deleting it twice, that seems like a recipe for problems. OK, and then finally, I think once you've done this one, the, the entirely lock-free isn't all that different. Now we don't acquire any locks. We just go with this compare and swap instead. So now, I guess for the, in this case, with the locks, if it turns out that the list isn't what you thought it was, like once you acquire the lock, it's not actually in the state you want it to be in, well, then you're going to have to restart. So it's similar to the, uh, the, the compare and swap in that regard, or the lock-free list. But in lock-free list, there's, I guess, more things that could go wrong. Um, or more, a couple of places where it could go wrong, at least when you're deleting, as opposed to just the one. So we talked about compare and swap quite a bit last time, so I won't go through that again. Um, but the general idea is basically compare and swap tells you if the, the, the pointer you were trying to assign to has changed since you last saw it. So it's similar to with the lock acquisition. With the lock acquisition, we acquire a lock, and then we can, in peace and quiet, look at pointers, look at the node, make, our, make up our mind, because nothing's going to change anymore after we acquire the locks. With the compare and swap, um, if you, well, all the, other, all the other threads are running at the same time. So things can change even while you're, while you're running your code. Um, so in particular, that was the case for the delete. We want to mark a node for deletion so that no one else tries to use it, tries to insert into it or, or after it. Um, but then between when we marked it and then when we actually remove the node from the list, then we'll have uh, potentially someone else could have changed things uh, in, in between. So um, there again, you'll just want to uh, restart if anything surprising shows up. To how would you do this restart? Any ideas? How do we make like restart an insert operation? Yeah. We just jump to the beginning. Ah, to the beginning of the list. Uh, yeah. You. I guess in the case of insert, that's probably fine. So you mean you would just uh, within your loop. You would say, like, assign the, the iterator to the beginning of the list and just, just continue. Yeah. yeah, that would be fine. Um, it could be that you're maintaining some state as well, some, for, uh, some sort of local variable that tracks, I don't remember now, but uh, um, say the key value or something like that, in which case you'd have to initialize that too, right? reinitialize it. So that's one way to do it. Any other ideas? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, so, so I guess if we want to do a recursive call, what we do is call ourselves again and then return immediately. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, that could work. It could also blow up your stack. Um, 
in case you're unlucky many times, the stack keeps growing and at, at some point there's no more room. There's one more. Oh, that you can't. We don't know which nodes have ch changed or not. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking uh, it's basically the same thing that uh, you're proposing, except there's a different way to implement it. And you're usually told not to use it. Go to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, you can stick a go to at the beginning. Oh, sorry, stick a, a label at the beginning. You say, like, retry colon at the beginning of your function. And then whenever things go sour, go to retry, and you're set. Um, that'll be probably a little easier than, than uh, sort of trying to reset your state. But uh, I, I think both ways are probably fine. In our case, because we have a while loop that just goes through all these linked lists, I think that's your solution is, is nice. If you have um, a, a for loop with some constant range and some, uh, some extra state, you'd have to reset all these things and it can maybe get a little complicated. In this, this is one of very few situations where a go to is actually quite handy. Um, there's one more, and that's when you want to handle error conditions. Um, so say you always want to, um, say at the beginning of our function, we, uh, we allocate some, some memory. And then we run a whole bunch of different system calls or whatever. We check error codes and so on. And, and rather than returning immediately when we have a problem, like returning a minus one, we need to first free um, this uh, the bit of memory that we allocated. And it's a very common way, a common design, is to use a go to. So you kind of have at the very bottom of your function, you have an error colon, and you have all this stuff you need to that you do to clean up from the function, and then return minus one. So you say go to error as opposed to replicating your code many times and uh, freeing up the state. Those are the two cases I've seen that where go to is uh, results in cleaner code as opposed to um, nasty code. Okay. Uh, I think that's that's about it. So on this one, we're doing, uh, in fact, for for all these three, we're doing three different kinds of graphs. Uh, one where we vary the list size, one where we where we vary the um, the number of threads, and one where we vary the update rate. Um, so we can try to draw some conclusions about about these. Okay. So I think an interesting question will be. Um, probably, well, it's probably pretty clear that this one is um, a lot faster than not using RCU because the readers can just run in parallel. But if you only have one thread, it's not very obvious. If you have two threads, not very obvious. But if you have 64 threads, then you really start seeing the, uh, the differences. Um, it's maybe a little less clear if this um, fine grained locking with RCU is better than just the big fat lock in RCU. Um, I think that'll depend on the size of the list, perhaps. Right? If the fine grained locking uh, doesn't give you that much for a, for a short list, probably in terms of concurrency, or if you have a low update rate. Right? So hopefully you'll see something like that in the graph. Um, and then it'll be very interesting to see, I think, uh, whether this entirely lock free is better than the fine grain locking. They're quite similar. Uh, both of them use, are using atomic operations. The locking um, has the benefit of preventing others a little more reliably from changing the list while you're working on it. Um, but not entirely. Uh, and so you will probably get a few more restarts with your uh, non-locking or non-locking and and more overhead with the fine grain locking. See how that plays out. That'll be interesting. OK, any questions on the homework? Nope. All right, so um, I felt I gave a pretty poor service to the, um, the delegation stuff last time. 
especially this um, uh, dedicated server delegation. So I thought I'd uh, spend most of the, the rest of this lecture on an old conference talk um, from last year and uh, some, some new results that we have. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit about what we're up to in, in my research group. And uh, uh, perhaps some of you uh, would be interested in, in uh, joining in this effort later on. Um, all right. So it starts out with what I presented in, in Shanghai last year. And then we'll have lots of other, uh, um, or s some other results later on. So um, the, the system is or was called fast forward. The uh, delegation as a whole is not something that we have invented. It's a relatively uh, old, well-known concept, this general idea of just um, asking another thread to do some work. And it's been known that it has nice scalability benefits. If you have lots of threads trying to access a, a lock, you can often get this congestion collapse. But if you um, uh, use delegation, you, you, it was thought at least that you have to suffer from low performance because there's a lot of overhead to, to do this delegation work. But uh, when you add more threads, you don't get this con congestion collapse, so it has a scalability benefit in that regard. So Sepide and Nilanjana are um, two people who worked on, on that part of the project, and now Noman is also uh, part of the, of the same project. So let's start with a very simple example. Um, here we have a, a little function, and we want, want to increment a sequence number. So does anyone have any have an estimate? Uh, how fast can you run this program? How many times? I, to basically run this function. Per second. Do we know anything about sequence number? Uh, global variable, but no one else has, no one else is acce accessing it. Let's say single thread. Yeah. Four billion times. Okay, that's probably a little optimistic because it's a function call as well, yeah. but it's billions of times. Yeah. Um, so I call it one billion. It all depends on, on specific clock frequency and such. Four billion is a good guess. Um, it's certainly not four million, right? And it's pr probably not uh, 10 billion. Okay, uh, but then, yeah, so that's if you run it on a single thread. But if we want to do that on multiple threads, there's a couple of things we have to change, right? First of all, um, well, a couple of things to consider. First of all, you can't just do this. You have to have synchronized access to the, to the variable. And then it's also a, a global variable. And so now you're modifying it, which means the variable itself, the cache line of the variable, will have to go from, from the other core to my core and then on to the next core that wants to access it. And that itself will add a lot of execution time. So uh, if we want to make it multi-threaded, we have to go like this. And then uh, uh, any estimates? I want to take a guess. And this is now if we run it multi-threaded. A single thread is actually not that bad. This lock acquire basically just does a compare and swap on the lock, sets it to one always, like it's always uh, able to get it, and the release just sets it to zero. Pretty straightforward. But multi-thread is a little different. One million is the guess. 10 million. Oh. Any other guesses? No. Well, actually, I think your your uh, both guesses are very good. Um, what we've found is you know it's less than 10 million, but between one and 10, something like that. In fact, here's a plot. So when you vary the number of hardware threads, this is test and set. This is a spin loop with just a compare and swap. 
Uh, this is a test and test and set, right? It's the spin is using, or the inner spin is using a normal read, and then there's a compare and swap outside. This is with a, um, a weight, so the OS is uh, putting the thread to sleep if the lock is busy. MCS is the um, it's one implementation of a Q-based lock. So here we uh, spin on different variables. You add your elements to a Q, you add an element to a queue, and then you wait until that um, element changes state. Right? So whoever is was before you, the way you free the, the lock is you tell whoever is next in the queue that, oh, now you can have it. So now everyone spins on a different thread, and that's much more scalable. And then as CLH is another implementation of that, which is quite similar. So, so what do we see? Well, with one thread, it's uh, the best you can do, looks like, is test and test and set. Oh, this is one thread or two threads, I'm not sure. Um, so we hit almost 10 million there. But then as you add more threads, it very quickly goes bad. Um, and it gets worse and worse. The test and set is really horrible, like less than 1 million. But then with the more scalable locks, that would be the MCS and the CLH, it stabilizes at about three million operations per second. But we were looking at a billion, and now with 128 threads, suddenly we're running at you know, three million if we were careful with our design. Okay, so why is it quite that slow? Uh, let's take a closer look into the, the Intel CPU that we were running on. We tried this on many machines, it's the same essentially for for every machine out there. It looks something like this, right? Uh, more abstractly. Okay, maybe we should quickly review this. So this is part of the last level cache. All of these big blocks are parts of the last level cache, the L3. It's distributed across the chip, actually. You usually don't notice that um, in terms of performance. This is probably the L2 cache, and I, maybe that's the L1 cache. Something like that. And the rest is you know, adders, multipliers, floating point operations, and branch predictors, and all that good stuff. And toward, on the edges, we have the, the interfaces to the rest of the world. Um, so it's uh, the memory bus, and the PCI bus, and, um, and whatnot. Right. OK, so, but more abstractly, it looks like this. So there's some sort of communication ring within one of those chips. In fact, this is a big chip. It has two of those rings with some, bu some buses or buffers in between for better scalability. Um, so each one of these is a core, right? So now if you're acquiring a lock, the, the lock resides in the L1 cache on one of those cores. You try to get the lock on another thread. It needs to move all the way over there. That's going to take some time. Um, and then yeah, we, we measure it to be about 70 nanoseconds or intra-socket latency to move, move one uh, cache line over like that. And so that means you should be able to get about 14 million operations per second. It's the best you can do with that. So if we order them like this, so, so, that, you, so that threads kind of um, interleave using the lock. You can't hope to get any more than 14 million operations per second because it just takes that long to move the lock around. You could do better if you just have one thread do all of its increments of this counter first, and then you do the next thread. Right? But now we're, that's kind of silly. And now that's essentially single threaded operation again. Single threaded operation is faster. Of course, it gets worse if you run this on a quad so socket machine. By socket, um, we're referring to um, the, the, the motherboard of a computer, the big circuit board of a computer, it has these little white sockets with lots of holes in them uh, that you stick a chip in. Right? So you say socket, it means that. It also means the chip itself. Right? The chip has many cores in it, but we have multiple uh, sockets on the motherboard in larger systems. In your laptop, generally speaking, there's only the one CPU um, or the one, one chip. I've seen, I think there are some coming out now with two. One uh, high power chip and then one low power chip uh, that uh, 
that basically handles the operation when you're not using the machine. Uh, for, for, a, for a phone, for example, uh, you might run a low power chip to just have some basic services using almost no power all the time, and then it kind of spins up the high power um, uh, chip when you're using the machines. But uh, in this case, it's just symmetric. So um, all of these sockets, they're connected by a QPI interconnect, and it's really fast. It can push some 20 gigabytes per second across one of these links. Uh, so that means some 150 to 300 million cache lines. And so in terms of pure bandwidth, we can, we can really get a lot of cache lines over there, right? We should be able to do 100 million locks moving around without any problem. But we're not getting that because the, um, because the latency just to go one way over this QPI link is some 200 nanoseconds. Right. So um, again, we're, we're limited by, by latency. And, and in this case, you would see about 5 million operations per second. So if we look at it from a thread's point of view, when you, whenever you're running your, your program, the critical section in this case is the count plus plus, right? Um, we have a little critical section. And then we're done with it. We release the lock. Now it's time for another thread to uh, enter a critical section. It waits for a while while the lock travels. It runs a little critical section and it waits for a while, and then we get the lock back. Right. So for almost all of this time, we're sitting around waiting for a lock. Right. And we're executing very little critical section. Naturally, if your critical sections are long, it's not so important. But you can't get away from this long wait for a lock. Right. If you're going to use um, synchronization, you're you're going to have this relatively long uh, wait for a lock. So we're in this case, with a very short critical section, we're seeing about a 400 times longer wait than the actual execution of the critical section itself for just two threads. And then if you make it three threads, you have to wait for the other two threads to finish their work. Right? So now the lock goes around like that, and now we're seeing 600 times longer waiting, and, and so on. Right? It's going to get... Uh, much, much worse when you have 100 threads. So the alternative that we're proposing is this delegation. Um, so here we have a single dedicated thread in the middle that is in charge of the data structure. No one else gets to modify it, for sure. Probably not even read it. There's some cases where it's better to allow others to read it, sometimes where it's not. Basically, depending on... Um, how fast we need the server to be. Uh, if another core has read a data structure, now the server has um, part of the data structure in read-only mode in its cache. So that means whenever you try to write to it, your write ends up in a store buffer pending the, the uh, invalidation of the cache line elsewhere. And that can severely limit server throughput. In any case, we have this dedicated server thread, and then we have all these other threads that we call clients. So in this case, it works something like this. You have a dedicated server thread um, that executes the critical sections, and the clients sort of ask it to do it. So here we have a request. The client says, OK, please uh, execute this critical section for me. And the server does it and then returns a response. And then you send another one. But that also takes 400 times longer. right? You spend 400 times as long waiting for the response as you do for the critical section. So what's the big deal? The big deal is what happens when you add another thread. So now we have both of these clients sending responses at the same time because they don't have to wait for each other to send the requests. Sorry. Um, we don't have, they don't have to wait for each other to send the requests. Requests kind of arrive in random parallel order. And then the server can execute two critical sections back to back, or at least as soon as it gets the request, it can execute a critical section. Um, and so now the, the wait, even when there were two clients, is only 400 times longer than doing it yourself. OK, so what happens when we add more threads? Well, it stays as many, you can add as many as you want, basically, until the server doesn't have enough CPU cycles to execute critical sections before the next uh, request comes in from a client, from the same client, right? So here, 
we still have some headroom, but at some point we got the response, we send another request. If the server is busy executing others critical sections, well, then we're kind of um, slow down again. Um, all right, so um, the design of our proposed system is something like this. It's proposed, that's how, you uh, how we say it in, uh, in, in all of research, basically because, well, we've, we've built it, we've evaluated it, but it's a research product. It's hard to use. It kind of, it's not something you would um, bring over to, to Amazon and just put into their code base at the moment. It's, um, it's a proof of concept. And all research products are like that, essentially. Yeah? Um, can you explain a little bit more how it's fitting at 400 times slower? That didn't seem clear. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, so basically, we're, I'm executing here one request, right? And I get my response in the same time. Um, if all of these clients sent the request at the same time, so they all start at the top, then you're right. It's not quite that time. It's not quite 400 times. Uh, uh, it'll be a little more. Like it'll be for the last one that gets served, it'll be 400 times plus the time of all these critical sections that was before it. Uh, next time around, though, this client got the response first. So it'll send its re next request first, and it'll kind of line up so that uh, the timing next time will be uh, about constant. If they're all doing work at the same speed and, and so on. OK. Uh, right, so this um, fast forward design, it looks something like this. Um, so we have a server that runs in an infinite loop. It's just checking a bunch of these requests. There's a big array of request lines, one line per thread, so you don't need any synchronization between the, the threads. Um, they all, uh, let's see. So the server runs through all of those looking for um, a, a new pending request. And we'll see what, what it means for a request to be pending in a moment. And then clients, they basically just write to their slot, and then they spin waiting for a, for a server response, which is uh, in a separate cache line. OK, so in a little bit more detail, it's called Fast Forward, or FFWD, for Fast Flyweight Delegation. Um, so we have these clients. They, they uh, write to their 64-byte request line, 64 bytes, because, well, cache lines. Um, the, they, oh yeah, sorry. They send these things say, asynchronously. In, no, no, they send, they, they send synchronously in the sense that they send a request and they wait for it. But the clients themselves don't coordinate among themselves, right? Because they each have their own request. They know that, oh, the server isn't doing anything, anything for me right now, so I can put a new request into that, that one slot. The server blows through a bunch of these requests and then um, writes all of the responses to one uh, response line. That was it's actually a slightly older design. Doesn't matter. Here's a um, it's a it's a good design in the sense that we're sending one 64 byte cache line back full of responses. So now the the requests they go out 64 byte. Uh, cache lines over to the server and responses come back in one cache line to a given core. Right. All these 15 that get a response, they all belong to the same core, kind of statically allocated this whole, this whole loop. Okay, so in a little more detail, every request has a toggle bit and you can tell from the toggle bit whether a request is pending. But it can be one or zero if a request is pending. It basically if it's changed, a request is pending. And another way to tell, we're actually passing these toggle bits also in the response. So the server says, it puts a, a response in here, and then it toggles the bit saying, oh, your response is ready. Um, if the two toggle bits are the same, um, then, then the response is ready. If they're different, that means a new request is pending. It's nice to have it this way because only the client ever gets to write to the request line. You could imagine the server changing the toggle bit to a zero saying, I've served it. Right? But in that case, now you have to invalidate the, the client's request line. It has to 
there's more traffic, basically. So now we have um, uh, a, a read-only for the server request line, a read-only for the client response line. And these toggle bits keep switching between 1 and 0 for every, for every re uh, request that's served. The actual request has a function pointer. I want you to run this function with these arguments, right, up to some number of arguments. We can fit six arguments in a, in a full-size 64-byte uh, request, uh, request line. Okay, so uh, so basically every server, the or the server in this case, runs through the requests, checks what it, what the number used to be and the what the bit used to be before, has a local re, uh, uh, copy of that. Sees oh that that's different, so let me run that that function and put a response in this response buffer, but it's not it's not to the re it's to a local response buffer. So we're not yet invalidating the client's previous responses. They don't know that we've done anything yet. Check the next flag. OK, there's another, another result. Let's do that in the response buffer. Oh, that's still an old request, right? So we don't need to do anything there, and so on. We fill the response buffer. And now we've done all of those re requests for 15 clients. And now it's time to copy our local responses over to the global response buffer that these clients are spinning on. We do it this way because if we were to write directly to the global response buffer, there's a good chance it, well, it would have to move over because we want to write to it, write the result to it. Now some clients, well, many of these clients, are spinning on it. So before we get to write the next response, it's already become read-only again because the first client got the copy. So now we want to write another response that we have to go back over. Every time we have to wait for these, uh, or every time the, the response buffer isn't in our local cache, we have to kind of wait for it, right? The write ends up in the store buffer. It's not really waiting, because we move on, but the store buffer fills up. And once the, once the store buffer is full, which happens very quickly in this kind of setup, we have to stop. We just have to wait until uh, the store buffer uh, has room in it. So this is a, a, a nice way of guaranteeing that all our stores are quick. And then we do one big mem copy over to the uh, global response buffer. Right. So let's see. Yeah. So now the clients write all their requests, right? They write requests in. The server starts polling for requests, and the request make their way over, but because they're so evenly spaced, the pre cache prefetcher will help us out. So it knows that, oh, they're probably going to be interested in, in these cache lines coming, so it'll, they'll, it'll start fetching those before we even need them, so you get uh, a fast reading of, of uh, the requests as well. Okay, and so on. So basically, um, all of these request lines make it back and forth, and then the response line shuffles back and forth. Sort of like that. All right, so we evaluated this on a whole bunch of machines. Um, one of them, this one, is the one that we'll use for this homework. Um, so it's a four socket machine with eight cores. Uh, well, eight, it's a 64 thread machine. We call it eight core here. I forgot what they call them now. AMD has a different name for it. AMD cores, they they, two pairs of them share some resources, like the maybe floating po point multiplication uh, execution unit is shared between co two cores. Um, so it's not quite a full core, whereas um, on an Intel machine, every core is completely separate, uh, but then Intel supports hyperthreading instead. So you get kind of, hard, in terms of hardware threads, these are 64 and it's 128 hardware threads. All right, there's all sorts of different families of, um, oh yeah, sorry, so we're evaluating primarily on, we're looking at the graphs on this one, uh, the biggest machine, but um, the results can apply to, to all of these. So we tried this on a whole bunch of different programs, and you may recognize uh, this one, ray trace 
car. Is that the one we used for our first homework, I think? Yeah. Um, but without bugs. Um, <coughs> so here we tried this with, um, let's see. So fast forward is this one, right? Uh, we tried with a few different methods for um, synchronizing access to shared memory. So basically, it's locking code. This whole program is, was written to use locks. Uh, but then we, we ported it over to fast forward as well. So this is the execution time in milliseconds, pretty short program, and uh, for a varying number of threads. RCL is a competing delegation method. It's really nice in that they have some automatic rewriting system that can take locking code and you just give it, uh, give RCL this program, it rewrites the program automatically and just works. Unfortunately, it's really slow by delegation standards. Okay, so uh, uh, a spin lock is horrible, right? It gets worse as you add more threads, much worse as you add more threads. It gets good up to eight, right? But after eight, it's no good, right? So, so this speaks to sort of the scalability of the various approaches. And then we have the, the various other more scalable locking approaches. They kind of form a nice tight cluster, but then there's fast forward, which basically doesn't go faster and doesn't go slower as you add more threads. There's a limit to the, the parallelism available in the program. Right? It, it maybe provides parallelism up to eight or maybe even 16, it looks like. But after that, it's just not enough threads to go any faster. At least it doesn't go worse when you add more, uh, more cores. So um, that's, I guess that speaks to the scalability of the system. And then, yeah, basically it runs the same speed as MCS and RCL. Um, like that, they reach the peak speed, but, but they, uh, uh, if you give it the wrong number of hardware threads, you're, you're out of luck. And mutex is just bad. So, so over the course of a whole bunch of different uh, application benchmarks, it looks more like this. So the, the column on the, w on the right, is the, so here we, we have a speed up over using p threads. Um, uh, right, let's see, speed speed up over. Let's let's say just speed speed up over mutex is what it is, p thread mutex. So uh, it's one mutex has a one everywhere, right? And so things go up to about two and a half times faster. We ported memcached d. It's a common key value store to delegation and that uh, at least the set side works a lot faster than the get side. It's a, about the same as some other approaches. Uh, but generally speaking, we get a nice um, performance boost on, on these somewhat significant applications. So, uh, yeah. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? Uh, reads and writes. What? Uh, oh, I see. So you're asking, what are we delegating? Yeah. So generally speaking, when you delegate a data structure, the all locks involved in that data structure have to go. Uh, the, the server doesn't run fast if it has to acquire locks. So, so basically, you rip out all the lock code, and you delegate all the functions that are applied to the, to the data structure. So you say, you basically ask the server for anything that regards this data structure, uh, go and ask. So in memcached, there's many data structures, and we delegated most of them. Right? Exactly, yeah. So you lose all parallelism when you do it with a single server. We'll talk a little bit about multiple servers later. Yeah. Um, the parallelism doesn't help you if all you're doing is waiting for locks. Absolutely, and I think this is why memcache on a, on a get-based benchmark, right. we're not doing much better, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so for many of them, it was kind of middling, but at least we're doing better or, or the same. Okay, so 
uh, what's going on with this uh, memcache set? If we look, just vary the number of threads, we'll see that um, the synchronization methods, they basically suffer because they're, uh, they can't handle the, the scaling. You have add more threads, they're just waiting for the locks. For memcached, there was uh, some global locks, maybe for statistics or maybe for the actual hash table. I can't imagine there would be a single global lock for the whole hash table, but possible. Um, whereas with fast forward, it, it goes a little bit faster, or with delegation and in general, it should be. So RCL, I think that maybe the translation layer they have is uh, a research product, right? So it, it works some, some of the time. That's why it kind of stops here. Um, flat combining, uh, we couldn't get to work. There was a, a flat combining library that we were going to use, but couldn't make that work. In general, for the other cases where we use flat combining, it's, it's not a competitive solution. OK, so in terms of micro benchmarks, we looked at individual data structures. So this is important when we do uh, evaluations for a research pa paper in general, at least in systems. People want to see um, application benchmarks, which, which take into account all of the stuff that goes into writing a normal program. Right? You're, you're allocating memory, and you're opening sockets, and you're dealing with statistics, and it's, there's a lot of stuff going on. And then there's micro benchmarks where we just look at one very small detail to see how this performs. And the microbenchmarks often, well, in this case, are all just data structures. So the homeworks that you've been working on lately are microbenchmarks, essentially. So we have a, a, a dumb linked list. We have a queue and a stack and a, this fetch and add. That's the one where we're doing I++ um, and a few others. So let's quickly take a look at these. So for a <coughs> What happens when you just use a, a linked list? Um, um, this is a, a size 1024 linked list, not a very large one. Um, and then varying the number of threads again, and there's just one uh, lock at the beginning of the, of the list. So this is nothing like what you would see uh, in this homework, that you're implementing your lock-free lists. None of these are, are lock-free. Um, but what's going on is basically as you add more threads, they don't get much benefit because there's one big fat lock. Um, and they get losses because they're all acquiring locks and moving cache lines back and forth with the data. Whereas with delegation, um, it goes, it's roughly the, the, the same no matter how many threads you have because the server is doing all of the work, it's single threaded execution essentially. So, I think overall, you see that the server is able to sort of get the single set, single threaded performance, um, which is usually not available in a multi-threaded setting. This one is really interesting, and I wonder if we should talk about uh, STM more at some point. It's called software transactional memory. This is an alternative to to locking, yet another alternative to locking. Um, but it's, it's quite different from, from uh, all the other things we've seen. Um, in STM, the, either the programmer kind of wraps all of its accesses to global memory in little helper functions, or you have a, a compiler that, that does this automatically for you. But one way or another, every time you write to a global variable, the program remembers that you wrote to a global variable. So with STM, maybe you've seen, if you've taken a databases class, you've seen transactions in the past. You say begin transaction, you do some work, and end transaction. And then when you end the transaction, it either works or it didn't work. And that's the same here with software transactional memory. So you you say, OK, start. I want to change my list. I want to insert this element to the, to the list. So let's start. And then I work without any locks, complete lock-free operation. I just do whatever I want on the list, and then I release the lock. Uh, sorry, I uh, end the transaction, and the underlying system decides whether it was successful or not. Generally speaking, it's successful if nothing that I read along the way was changed between the begin and the end of the transaction. So it's similar to uh, our lock-free implementation, right? The compare and swap. Um, where if, as long as the pointers didn't change, we're good. 
Oh, nothing I read or writ wrote to I changed. That way there's no interference. Whatever I did didn't interfere with any other uh, thread. But you can imagine there's some overhead in doing this. Right? You have to track all of your reads and writes. That's the read and write set. You have to look for an intersection between my read and write set and all the other threads um, that we're executing at the same time. So STM actually does a lot better than, than locking. But the extra overhead of coordinating with all these other threads eventually kills you anyway. Is that like a transaction manager that's like a separate thread that's taking the transaction? No, it's basically on, uh, on the end transaction is where you actually do the work. Oh. So the changes are not applied until you get to the end. It buffers all the writes. Lately, in, in uh, Intel's Haswell architecture and newer, they have some support for hardware transactional memory, uh, where you don't have to implement this tracking of the write sets. You, uh, you basically you tell the CPU, oh, leave all this in the store buffer. I think this is how, it, how they implement it in the, in the hardware. Say, OK, I'm going to start a transaction. Leave it all in the store buffer. And then at the end transaction, you can ask it uh, what the read, what the write set was, coordinate with other threads on your own, and then you can decide, like, I want to actually apply these changes. I think that's uh, roughly how they do it. Okay, so with a, with a two lock queue, the, the ones with a single lock are the best for a delegation, right? Because you, the competition only has single threaded execution anyway. Only <coughs> one thread at a time can be in the lock. So two locks is also really excellent. Um, and the stack, a stack has a single lock by nature. That's just how it's going to work. A queue you can do a little cleverly with two locks, uh, but basically, you can't beat delegation for for this sort of thing. And then for fetch and add with a single variable, so we're, we have a single count that we're incrementing. The same story. So here we're showing um, with the many different implementations and also with atomic increment, right? This is the lock inc x86 operation instruction. That's this one here. Basically, atomic increments can only push some 20 uh, million operations per second. This is with hardware support dedicated to incrementing uh, global variables. Right? All they can do is 20 million operations per second. If you can do it with delegation, we're in this case hitting some. 50 or so. Yeah. Doesn't it flatten out the path forward delegation flatten out at some point? Yes, but um, single threaded performance uh, of an increment of a variable, and this is a silly example, right? but it, it points out some interesting aspects of the, of the stuff. The single threaded performance is about a billion. So there's a lot of headroom there. Then, of course, there is the coordination of, of reading your requests and, and acting upon the requests. And we found uh, lately we're at about 18 cycles. So it takes 18 cycles extra to read the request, execute the request, and send the response back. So you couldn't go any faster than 2 gigahertz divided by 18. And then one, one or two for the, for the function call and, and the increment, I guess. Um, excellent questions, by the way. Thank you. And right, so that's the atomic increment. All right, we'll, we'll come back to the fetch and add in a little bit, but uh, for more concurrent data structures. This version of fast forward doesn't do all that well. So now we're starting, you have many locks. Right? We have, uh, this is a hash table, 128 threads, because it gets the most interesting when you have the most, most threads. And fast forward goes quickly. Uh, but maybe not super quickly. Here, it's going faster with more buckets. That's because now we're running with four servers. There's no reason to have just the one server. Right? If, you, if your data structure is really busy and clients want to access it and you have many locks in the data structure, like in a hash table, you can just split the hash table over four servers and then they each handle a, a quarter of the traffic. So that makes it go a little bit faster. But you know, we're still limited by having only four servers. So now the parallelism comes in with the hash table uh, really kicking our ass. Um, and that's something we'll see in a, in toward the end. We were continued working on this for a year after. And uh, 
things have changed a little bit. But basically, when you start having about the same number of locks as you have threads, probably better to use locks in this case. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and this is the I++ version. The, what was the previous one? The previous one was a hash table. All right, so here, I++, oh, sorry. Uh, here we're doing I++, um, but with multiple variables. Right. So same thing. The hash table has some extra overhead to it. So if you want to just bring it down to the absolute minimum, you'd have uh, a number of global variables that are, are uh, that each have their own lock. So we get uh, about some, what is this, 90, 80, 90 million operations or so, but we're peaking out of that because the servers um, can't go any faster, or b maybe in this case because the clients can't go any faster. This extra round trip that we're always doing with the requests and responses. Um, and as you, if you add this atomic increment, we see that, oh, like, as you add parallelism, this delegation thing isn't maybe the best, the best design. Uh, atomic increments do very well, but they actually can't beat locking uh, at the, at the uh, greatest concurrency. And that's because um, the overhead of the locks don't really matter. What matters here is the latency to to uh, move a cache line back and forth when you have enough when you have enough uh, parallelism. Okay, and then we had another concurrent data structure, um, uh, a lazy concurrent list. Um, so this is a more clever list where you traverse, much like the homework we're doing today. Um, we traverse by uh, read-only uh, readers concurrently, and then you make your changes acquiring a lock or um, de delegating. Uh, so here we see that as the list grows longer, uh -huh, in fact, um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So as the list goes longer, the server needs to do more work. And it doesn't really, um, it doesn't scale nicely. Um, but then uh, maybe it's just the case that this kind of list isn't, really isn't a good idea for delegation. Like super long critical sections, probably not something you want to use for delegation. What happens if we use a skip list instead? So now we added a skip list. Harris list, that's Tim Harris, that's the paper that I referred, referred you to. <coughs> right, the Harris list oh, probably does okay. Where is it? This is the Har Harris list, yeah. So it does well until the size grows too big and then it's not so good anymore. I'm not sure why. Anyway, so with us, if you use a skip list instead, and skip list cannot be implemented well with, uh, with locks. They're, uh, they're mostly, uh, as far as I understand at least, mostly a single threaded data structure because you have to change many different places whenever you update your, your skips. Whereas uh, with delegation, it is a single threaded data structure still. So a skip list is really well suited to delegation. So there we can do much better. Sometimes we have to make a, a data structure choice, I suppose, differently when you do it, when you run delegation than when you uh, use locking. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Right, so here we run with a single lock, big fat lock. Right. Skip list with a big fat lock, that really stinks. Okay, and then we had a binary search tree. Um, I think I'll just skip that in the interest of time. But if we're able to shard the tree, we can also do uh, tremendously better than a locking design. Sharding meaning cut the tree into four sizes sort of statically four pieces statically, based on the, the key space. And that isn't always doable. It depends uh, on, on if the, the tree is sort of naturally, unif naturally balanced. Okay, I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, so what makes it fast? I think we covered some of this. So I'll skip that. Um, but what makes it slow is more interesting for this class, I think. So um, the link bandwidth suggests that we should be able to do at least 300 million operations per second, not 50. Or, 
Um, and in fact, we have four links, so we should be doing much better than that. And based on the latency of, of these links, you know, if you have 120 clients, which we did in this case, um, we should get 300 million operations per second. So why are we only seeing 55? Um, maybe it's because uh, you just can't go any faster. Like the, the server needs at some time to do its work. Right? 40 cycles per operation, that's, that's fair. But that really um, turns out that wasn't quite right. And it, it doesn't um, make sense if you add more servers, we should be at least getting if you have enough servers, you should be getting your 300 million operations, but we didn't. Um, so, and then maybe there's some insufficient concurrency going on. Uh, how many um, cache lines can you can you put in this um, uh, in this pipe at the same time? The pipe is relatively long, right? It's uh, uh, 200 nanoseconds, and the bandwidth is really high. Um, so uh, we can have 120 going on at the same time. Now, are we able to? Ex are we exploring that properly? Or exploiting that properly? It seems like something um, something is a little off. So it could be the server store buffer is limiting us. In fact, that was one big part. We stopped using the store buffer using streaming stores later on. There's a um, in a, in an updated design. There's they're called non-temporal stores or streaming stores. It just sends a store right to the memory. It doesn't wait for the store buffer to clear. It doesn't order instructions at all. It just goes for it. It's really difficult to program with because you have no guarantees about the ordering. Uh, but for a very limited case like this, it actually turned out quite nicely. Um, but to, I want to tell you a little bit about our, our more recent results. So here we have. You've seen this before. Basically, um, we get, oh, with four servers, we ended up with about 110 million operations peak. Right? But locking does much better. But why did we stop the axis here? Well, it's basically because things don't go any faster after that. Um, and fast forward was just flat, so we weren't interested in the rest. We thought we'd zoom in the graph. Um, it turns out it actually goes a little bit faster after that. So here's, that's what we plotted. It, it does go up a little bit more. Um, but basically it's flat or down after that, as you add more variables. But this one is uh, our new design that we sent to a different conference. Uh, this year it's, it's called, uh, well, doesn't matter. We call it JetBard, but I'm not sure it'll keep the, that name. This, you have to have different names. Every time you should be anon anonymized. So no one knows who's doing the work. So we have to have uh, submitted with a new name. Probably keeps calling it fast forward in the end. OK, but so with our new design, we're actually getting something more like 400 million operations per second. So what's really interesting about this is that now we're basically faster than, or at least competitive, it's basically the same, uh, with locking even in an embarrassingly parallel um, uh, situation. So with, with this fetch and add or with hash tables and so on, delegation is actually faster even if you have as many locks as you want. And that was a little surprising. Um, or started out being a lot surprising and then as you learn more and more about it, maybe it's less and less surprising. But um, the, the reason is, and I don't have all the graphs for this, but the reason is that um, when you acquire a lock, you have to uh, execute an atomic instruction. Atomic instructions are like M fences, right? None of the reads and writes before the atomic instruction can be executed after the atomic instruction and vice versa. So the whole thing basically grinds to a halt until the atomic instruction is finished. And now you're acquiring a lock from some, usually from a different core, 200 nanoseconds right there. Whereas with delegation, there are no atomic instructions. You can just flush out all your requests as much as you want. But of course, you're just going to wait for the server, right? We had a 400 times wait for the server. There's no changing that. So the way we fixed it 
is we start using uh, a user threading library. So the, each thread, it sends out a request to the server, and then it says, OK, I'm done for now. It's going to take forever before I get this response. So now you run another thread on the same CPU. Instead of spinning, you just start running another thread. And then that can issue a request. And the next thread can issue a request. And then maybe we're done. At around three or four, probably, the benefits start kind of diminishing. And now the response is ready from the first server. So we didn't wait. We're just doing more work while, while one thread is waiting for the response. And that's how you get to some 400 million. Yeah. So Approach using an event loop. Using an event loop. Uh, let's see. More specifically, you mean the server would have an event loop, no, or? Uh, the so ah, yeah. So, but event loops don't provide uh, any sort of mechanism for shared memory access. So, so, in some sense, there's a. You could think of this as, oh, I send a request and I wait for an event to come back. Um, Event loops require a different programming model than multi-threaded. It's harder to scale to more threads, perhaps. But, uh, but in some, some ways, it's, it's related, I suppose. But the, the delegation aspect is, is not related. It's more, more the programming model, perhaps. So in order to get this performance, though, you actually have to have um, really fast, uh, sorry, you have to have a really high parallelism on the client side. Right? You need not only 128 hardware threads to, to fill up, but now you need multiple fibers, these user level threads, on each one of those hardware threads. So applications that have really high parallelism can really benefit from delegation. Um, but if all you have, if your application has three threads, you know, it doesn't matter what hardware you're running on, it doesn't matter, then you can't really do much with it. Because there is a higher latency. Sending a request to a server and waiting for the response is longer than just waiting for the lock to get to you. It's, it's a round trip as opposed to one way. So you get twice the latency. But if we can do useful work while we're waiting, who cares? OK, so some limitations. Yeah, we need more, many more clients, especially if you want to deal with many servers. Right? If you have 16 servers like we do here, uh, 16 hyper-threads are running servers, then well, you need a lot of clients to fill up those servers. It's not enough to have, well, you, you would have, a, have to have at least 16 clients on each thread. And so you can hand off work to all 16 servers. Um, so in the worst case, we're actually working with 64 on each thread, and thousands of threads to get this uh, to run the fastest. OK, so um, yeah, a couple of limitations. It is sometimes more complicated uh, than locking in the sense that you have to think about resource allocation. Like, oh, how many threads do I want to dedicate to servers for this program? Right. With locking, it kind of happens automatically. Everyone sits around waiting. Um, uh, it could be that it's too expensive to allocate a whole hardware thread to uh, managing a data structure. That all depends on, on your program. Um, and if you're not actually accessing the data structure much, then better to use threading. If you have a threaded program and you want to port it to delegation, that can be challenging. It depends on how complicated the, the synchronization scheme is. On the other hand, if you write the program, it can often be easier to write the program for delegation than for lock-in because the data structure can be single-threaded. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, I'll skip this. We have some future work uh, where where you can fit in if you get an A in the class and you want to do a, a research, undergraduate research sort of thing, or your master's student, you want to do a master's project um, in the spring. Uh, there's uh, adaptive delegation, basically maybe varying the number of servers, maybe moving data structures between servers. Um, flat delegation is this weird idea where we don't actually have servers. Like every thread is both a server and a client, and everyone's responsible for some things. Um, uh, our TA, Ben, is working on this delegation in, in Rust. So that's quite different, uh, very interesting. And then um, Norman is working on a delegation over RDMA, where we 
uh, RDMA being a, a, a network technology. So basically we want to spread the system so you can have the server running on one machine and the client running on another machine and make it look like they're all part of the same computer, basically. Um, OK, and then if you want to run it deterministically to make sure you always get the same output, um, that's another uh, direction. OK, I will skip the related work. And that's it for today. So um, please get started with the homework. I set the, the deadline to next Thursday, but I'm thinking maybe we should do it the Tuesday after that. Um, and uh, have a good weekend. <laughs>